Good morning, and certainly a wonderful blessing to once again preach the God's Word. And as we've been studying through the churches of Asia Minor, you've noticed a couple of things that we've seen over and over again, that there are some problems in these congregations. But as we will see, two out of the seven congregations are ones who are good and faithful to the Lord. The two were Smyrna and Philadelphia, which we're studying today. But as we see all these challenges that the churches face, like Thyatira was facing with the woman Jezebel, who was sadly teaching the people to commit idolatry and fornication, the church that we see at Ephesus, they had left their first love. We see the church at Smyrna, it's trying to stand strong and be faithful to God. We see also the church at Pergamos, that was being sadly taught, some of them were teaching the doctrine of Balaam and Balak. Same doctrine that, that Jezebel was teaching in, to the church at Thyatira. So you can see the problems that churches face from time to time. And how do we deal with such problems? How do we face such challenges? And as we can see, we must listen to Jesus. We must do what he says. He is the king of kings. He is the head of the church and one that we ought to follow. And so <clears throat> when we look at the church of Philadelphia, I'm certainly the case that we want to be more like this church here at Dibral. When we think about it, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And definitely we see that because we are to stand out in this world. We're not to love the world. We're to be separate from this world. And we're to set our light on a hill, as Chad prays over and over again in his prayers, that we are, as Jesus says, you're going to be that city that's set on a hill. And you cannot be hidden. And that's what we ought not to be. We ought not to be hidden. But to show that as this world keeps growing more deeper and deeper into sin, we have to see to it that we help people to help people to understand that the light of the church will go stronger because we are able to help people to guide them toward the right direction, and that is the word of God, to obedience to it. And that's definitely what we see at the church at Philadelphia, one whose light was shining in the midst of darkness. And that's what the church of Dibral ought to be more like. As the Bible says in verse 13, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We are to listen to what the Holy Spirit says through the Word of God on what the church should be like. And we ought to, if we're not being that, what the church is supposed to be like, then we need to repent and come to love our first love again. We need to turn back to God and give Him back our very all. So as we've been doing with the other churches, we want to first look at the city. We want to evaluate it because you'll see that we can take the history of Philadelphia and apply it to the context of the church. And then, of course, we want to evaluate the church. How does Jesus look at it? And, of course, what we want to do is look at the geography, its history, and we also want to look at its religion. If we look at the geography today in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, you'll remember that the seven churches of Asia Minor are kind of in a horseshoe. And we're getting near the end of the horseshoe, where you see the church at Philadelphia today is. Uh, I'm sorry, the city of Philadelphia is today. Of course, not the city in the United States, the other one in Asia Minor. Uh, so we see where it was actually on a, the longest, one of the longer roads that led to Rome. You know, I've heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome. Well, this is one of those roads that led to Rome. And as you can see, Sardis and Philadelphia were on this main road. And so that's really something interesting to think about when we look at the geography. I kind of wanted to give you a 3D uh, imagery of what it would have been like to live here. I mean, you see the mountains on the side and see the river that runs through it. Certainly a good place to, to, for a city to be at because you could actually... You know, hot, you could uh, basically hide out here because of the mountains, the barriers of people trying to come over and try to overtake you. Well, they have to climb the mountains, don't they? Well, we can see that mountain comes through, I mean, sorry, that valley comes through, uh, this uh, road comes through here, and it's a nice place for a uh, city to be. Uh, just like the uh, city of Thyatira, there's not much that remains. Um, you remember Thyatira was surrounded by the modern-day city, and they just had this little archaeological site. Well, it's the same thing here. Uh, we can see that actually the name of this Philadelphia now is actually means the city of Allah. It's a place where the Muslims live now. And um, 
you could see a 6th century AD church building that was in honor of John the Apostle. And of course that makes sense because of John writing to the books, uh, writing the book of Revelation to these seven churches. And this is one of those pillars that was still remains. And as you can see, it was a big building, a uh, big Byzantine church. Uh, also you can see a sarcophagus there, and that's pretty much all there is. There's not much that remains. And uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like today. And then, of course, we want to look at the history. Now, when we look at the history, why was it called Philadelphia? Well, you'll remember that Pergamus had a, uh, you know, it was when uh, Alexander the Great, he had four generals that took over his territory. Lysimachus took over the territory where we see Asia Minor is today. And Lysimachus, after he died, he gave it to Philasterus, and Philasterus, he started building on the city of Pergamus. Now, Pergamus started to spread out a little bit, and Philadelphia was under their control. So we see that the two kings that were under the control of Philadelphia was Eumenes II and Attalus II. Now, after Attalus II came to power, that was his brother, Eumenes II, and he had such a love for his brother and the people saw their, his love for his brother that they actually renamed Attalus II to Philadelphus. And that's what the city is named after, Philadelphia, brotherly love. Well, it was established in the 150s BC, so it's the youngest of all the seven uh, cities of Asia Minor that we're studying. And then we see what was meant to, were it to be was that Pergamus since they established this Sardis and also we see Philadelphia, well, what they wanted to do was they said, hey, we want to spread Greek culture. This is a great springboard here. Let's spread the culture all across Asia Minor. So that's what they did. In fact, the Lydians stopped even learning their own native language to learn Greek. Can you imagine if... Uh, we here in this congregation had to, you know, if a new language came in that we learned it and we just stopped using English. Well, that's how much the culture changed in this city of Philadelphia. Well, that's an interesting concept because I want you to remember that this was an open door of opportunity for their culture to spread. So I want you to remember that. But second of all, I want you also to remember that it was given over to Rome when the king of Pergamus died, uh, Atlas III, I believe it was. He decided to say, well, I don't want to go against Rome, so I'm going to bequeath it to Rome, and that's what he did. Well, it was also destroyed by an earthquake, just as we saw that the city of Sardis was destroyed in an earthquake in AD 17, and Emperor Tiberius, who was running at that time, said, let's rebuild the city. So they did. They rebuilt it, and they built it with a new name, Neo Caesarea. Now, of course, that means New Caesar Territory. And, of course, they are naming it in honor of Tiberius the Emperor. But what was interesting about it is that in 8020, Strabo, who's an historian, who's a geographer, he came to the city of Philadelphia, and he started realizing that there were people living here that they were living, still living in huts. They did not return to their city, which was still, sadly, in shambles. They were too afraid to return. And there's a, something for us to think about is that the people wanted to return. They wanted to return to their, to their houses that were made out of pillars and marble and such like instead of living in tents, instead of living in huts. And that's something that we're going to see to the church in Philadelphia when you read it very carefully. Well, after the death of Tiberius, it was named back to Philadelphia. And uh, then it was renamed again under the reign of Vespasian. And so they just get, went with well, their name. They wanted to fit the city, you could say. Well, thirdly, we see that a major portion of the city, a major portion of the population was Jewish. Well, as you read through the church at Philadelphia, you're going to notice that some, some of that language is taken from the Old Testament. And, of course, the Old Testament was written to the Jews. But also we see that Christians in the early first century were once Jews, and, that, and they understood the Old Testament. So they're going to really understand. And if we, of course, read and study our Old Testaments, we're going to understand the book of Revelation. And so that's what we want to do with looking at the city. So we've looked at its history. We've looked at the geography. Now let's look at the religion real quickly. 
uh, basically what would take place is that you'll see that Philadelphia was located by that river, and so it was a perfect climate for them to do wine production. And unfortunately, we know that that would pro lead to the sin of drunkenness because people are going to get drunk, and they're going to sadly serve the god of drunkenness and drinking parties. In Roman, his name was Bacchus. In Greek, his name was Dionysius. And so that was the gods that were served here. There was actually many other gods that were served, and they actually named Philadelphia the Little Athens because there were so many gods here served. And so that was the religion of Philadelphia. Now, if you turn with me to evaluation of the church, we're going to look at very carefully what it says in Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. First, I want you to see that it's very important to see the designation of Jesus, what he stands for. We've kind of done this before with Christ because it's very important. He wants them to know that he is the author, that he is the one who is sending this message, and to be careful and take heed to the warnings uh, that he gives. So that's why it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. First of all, notice that Jesus is literally in the Greek language, it says he who is the holy one. Now do you remember that designation being used? It's used in the Old Testament. In fact, it's used mostly in the book of Isaiah. You ought to read the book of Isaiah and see how many times the title of the Holy One is applied to God. So Jesus is God, is what he is stating. He is the Holy One. He is the one that is transcendent. He is the one that is above and beyond creation. That he is the only other, only other, because there is no one like God. And so there's something to be said here about the Holy One. In fact, one of those references of the Holy One is found in Isaiah 10, verse 20, where it says, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped to the house of Jacob will never again depend upon him who defeated them, but will depend on the capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel and truth. So Jesus is indeed Yahweh. Jesus has indeed, has sadly, our, our, uh, our Jehovah Witness friends, they say that he is not God. But here is a clear verse in Revelation 3, pointing back to Isaiah 10, that he is indeed God. He is Yahweh. Revelation 3, verse 7, the Bible goes on to say he is the Holy One. He is the True One. He is literally the Amen. You know, Amen means let it be so. Let it be. It is true. And so Jesus is the Amen. In fact, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he is said to be yes and no. He is said to be the Amen. Because for Jesus, he is the truth of all reality. He is the one that created this world. He is the one that makes all things consist in this world, that keeps upholding it by the word of his power. He's the one that came to die on the cross through the will of his Father in heaven, to die for our sins. Because we were such creatures who are in need of salvation from sin. Jesus does not want us to go to hell. He wants us to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so he is indeed the true one. And then notice it says, He who has the key of David, he who opens, and no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. If you notice in your Bibles, that's in italics. And we're usually when a book is... Uh, Usually in italics, it means it's from a Old Testament reference. Well, ex this is exactly what we find. If you look in Isaiah chapter 22 with me, Isaiah 22, verse 20 through 23, you'll see the background of why this was said. And the Bible says, Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. And he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. So just notice this for a moment with me. Imagine you wanted to come before King David. And so 
Of course, like we've seen in the book of Esther, could anyone just come before the king? <laughs> no. You'd, you'd be dead on the spot. And But we see Esther, she did come and appear before the king. Now, with regards to the same kind of idea and procedure here in Israel, that if you wanted to see King David, you had to go through Eliakim. Eliakim was the one who would open the door or close the door. He had the keys to open or close it. And so you could only go through Eliakim. It was only through him that you could come see the king. Well, imagine that connection now to Jesus Christ, where it says, He who has the key of David, he who opens, and no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. Jesus is the only one that we can have access to God the Father. It's no wonder that Jesus would say in John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. It's very important for us to recognize that Jesus is making an exclusive claim that he is the only one that we can come to. There is no other name under heaven in which we can be saved. Only through Jesus Christ can we be saved from sin. And so that's what is being said here, that no one can open it, no one can shut it, but the Lord. He is the only one who has the keys of David. But furthermore, notice with me, so we've looked at the designation of Christ, look with me at the deeds of this church. And certainly these deeds that this church is performing, because they are having their faith active, because faith always has action, and it will always produce fruit. And so that's what we see this church doing, is good deeds. As he would say, Revelation 3, verse 8, I know your works. Does he not say that in a lot of other congregations? He said that to the church at Ephesus. He said that to the church at Sardis. I know what you're doing. There's an all-seeing eye watching us. Knows what we're doing day in and day out. And it's a question that, our question that comes up is, what are we sowing? Because whatever we're sowing, we're also reaping. We cannot mock God. What we shall, if we sow to the flesh, we shall reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, the things of a spiritual mindset, then we will sow, reap everlasting life. And so which one are we sowing and reaping? Because we cannot, we cannot hide from God. We can't out, outwit God. And, and we need to stop playing games with God and be honest with ourselves and look in the mirror and say, and evaluate our own lives and say, you know what? I'm not doing what's right. I'm not living up to the standard God has called me to, and I need to do what's right. I need to obey His will, and I hope and pray that we're doing that. So He says, I know your works. And so that's why it would say in Hebrews 4, verse 13, There is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. So He goes on to say, See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Remember how Philadelphia was the springboard for their culture to keep on spreading throughout Asia Minor. Well, here we see that Christianity, this is a great place, this is a great door of opportunity to spread Christianity and to keep on going throughout the world. That's what we see here. That's this open door of opportunity. And we see many examples of this in the Bible. In fact, Paul would say in Acts 14, verse 27, now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. See, the Gentiles were now ready to receive the gospel in Acts 10 and 11. And so just as the Jews had the opportunity to receive the gospel. In, Acts, in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So, see a door of opportunity open for Paul. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, I preached Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. You see, we need to think about that there are doors of opportunity open to us. So those who are sitting in high school, we have a door of opportunity to our friends to teach them the gospel. To those who are in college, we have an opportunity. To those who are in the workplace, we have an opportunity. We have to... Be responsible to take that opportunity and make that happen because the Lord does open doors for us and we need to walk through them by faith. But there's also something here that you might think about that's also being said. John 10 verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. There's obviously a 
still an opportunity. Today is an opportunity for us to be come to know God and His ways of salvation. And that is to know the truth. And that, sadly, there won't be an opportunity maybe later because it might be the case that the Lord will return. And that will be a sad day for those of us who are not prepared to meet God. And so that's why it's so very important to walk through this door of opportunity. Well, he goes on to say, For you have a little strength. A little strength. You know, you have to think about certain congregations. Some congregations are obviously get to do more than others, don't they? Because they do have the finances. They do have the members. They do have the ways of going about doing things that are much better. And, of course, uh, we are a small congregation. But we have a little strength. We have what we can do, and that we should do what we can for the God of heaven. We have a little bit of finances. We need to use that. And that's what God expects of us. He wants us to use what we've got. And we ought to give the Lord all that we can give to him. So that's why he says, You have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. And as Jesus would say, If you love me, keep my commandments. And that's obviously what they were being faithful to God. And that's something we should all strive to be doing. And then it says, you have not denied my name. They were not like Antipas. Uh, they were, I mean, they were like Antipas, who, sat, who was one of the faithful martyrs in the church at Smyrna, who gave his life, who did not deny Jesus Christ. And we should not deny Jesus as well, because if we do, he will deny us. Because Jesus said, Whosoever confessed me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And so we should not deny the Lord in our daily lives. So we see the designation of Jesus, the deeds that this church was doing, the faithfulness it was showing. We also look at the downfall of their enemies. Revelation 3, verse 9 says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. This is very interesting. If you look back at the church at Smyrna, there, again, Jesus calls them the synagogue of Satan. Now, that's something, that's, and something to say about people who are not following God. Are we following? I mean, they were basically saying he's a, they're the church of Satan. They're being called out to do Satan's work. Are we being called out to do Satan's work? We are if we're living a life of sin. And we don't want to be like these Jews because there was a time when it was faithful and good to do the Lord's will under the old covenant because it was before the cross of Christ. Because that was God's law for Israel. But see, what occurred was that Jesus came, he died on the cross, he nailed the, the law of Moses to the cross. Nobody is under the law of Moses anymore. But sadly, there are those who wanted to keep the law of Moses to be effective. Well, that's sadly turning it into idolatry. And idolatry is serving Satan. And that, that's obviously what they were doing. They were serving a false religion now. And they are, say they're, they're, they're Jews, but they're really not. Who was the true new Israel? It was the church of Christ. That's who the true new Israel is, not old Israel. And that's what Jesus is trying to say is he is making a distinction between new Israel, the church, and old Israel. And saying, you must be a part of the church. You must be a part of me. And sadly, there are many Jews who did not obey the Lord, who did not obey the gospel. And so what do we see happen? Well, we know that those who nailed Jesus to the cross, they said, let his blood be upon us and our children. And therefore, 40 years later in AD 70, Jesus came in a sense and came through those Roman armies and destroyed the, destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And that's obviously what the allusion is here. They will come, it says, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. These people will know who the true people of God are. And that's why he would go on to say in verse 10, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth or the land. And what we're going to see here is that, you know, if 
if the book of Revelation was written in AD 66 or so, then four years later, there's this test of trial that's going to come upon the whole world because the Roman Empire is going to come into Judea and crush the Jews and destroy them. And so this is going to, and it, it seems to be the case that, you know, during this time, oh, you know, you need to go back to be joined up with the old Israel. It's okay to do so because, look, we still have the temple standing. Everything's going well. Why do you want to be with a bunch of Christians who are being persecuted? Well, we see that this hour of trial is going to come and going to reveal who the true people of God are, and that is it is the church of Jesus Christ. So we see the downfall of their enemies and you see, friend, we don't want to be a part of the downfall. We don't want to be on the devil's side. We want to be on the Lord's side because it's through him that we have the victory. And it's when we keep our faith in him that we will overcome the world. Well, then Jesus says to the man to persevere. He goes on to say, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have and that no one may take your crown. You see, it can be the case that if we're not living faithful, then we, our crown will be taken away. We will not gain the victory. And that certainly defeats this false doctrine known as once saved, always saved, if no other verse does. And then he goes on to say, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now that's very interesting. Remember that people who went through that earthquake in AD 17? You know, they were still living in huts. They, they longed to return to their houses that were made out of marble and pillars. Stability. Well, you can see the connection here is that we're to look to a place that has true stability, peace, love, joy, heaven itself. That's what we're to look forward to. We're not to look to this world that is sadly unstable in so many ways that is passing away. And that's why he goes on to say, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out, out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Well, remember Philadelphia was named different names, weren't they? Named a new name. Well, here we have those who overcome will have a new name, who keep on persevering. And that's something that we need to think about that a new name is basically meaning that they have that God has ownership over them. God owns us. And as he says in Revelation 21 verses 1 through 3, you can see this very clearly where where John says, "Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I John saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God." prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. You see, God owns us if we have obeyed the gospel. He bought us back with his own blood, and therefore we want God to have ownership over us so that he will take back his own to be and the eternal presence of himself. Don't you want to be in the eternal presence of God? It's something for us to all really think upon, to meditate upon. This church of Philadelphia gives us great lessons to learn. And if there's something that we can read about here is that, you know, the Lord had nothing bad to say about this congregation. Nothing to say. And the question really comes down to is, what will he say about us? What will he say about you? Are you living faithful? Are you living as God would have you to live? Or maybe you haven't even begun a Christian life yet. Would you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be immersed in water for the mission of your sins? Then you can have ownership. You can be a part of that ownership. You can be in the body of Christ and live faithful and be with God and throughout all eternity. But it's sad if you don't then sadly, that's where hell is reserved for those who are ungodly, who do not want to live as God would have them to live. Which choice will you choose? Please choose today to obey the gospel while again we stand and sing the invitation song.